Pretty much the interesting thing here is the number of layers that it takes to operate a successful internet service. So basically, um, there's all these technical layers, like your server has to be plugged in, you have to have a network connection, um, you need a working operating system, you need a working database management system, because most people, as we'll see uh, in a future slide, have decided that you need some kind of database management system to deal with the problem of a thousand users at the same time trying to do the same operation. Uh, so sorting out the concurrency aspects of internet service. Uh, then oftentimes you start with some kind of toolkit. So I've put Ars Digital Community System here because, like I said, this is an Ars Digital Marketing slide, but it could be something like Broad Vision or uh, Vignette uh, or something else, some set of package software that solves a lot of your problem. At most web services, though, because uh, the internet is a new thing, and the application, the front of things that people want to do with the internet keeps expanding. Most people find that whatever package software they've gotten isn't actually enough. It doesn't solve the whole problem. And they need to write some service-specific software on top of that. So those are a whole bunch of different technical layers. And they actually require a wide range of skills. So if you know about diesel generators, you, know, you might not actually be an expert application programmer. And actually, if you know about maintaining a database, you might or might not know about maintaining an operating system. Um, and it seems to require a huge range of skill. So I think that's why a lot of these internet businesses or internet services, why it took them so long to get good, and why a lot of them aren't very good even today. Because in a department of a big company or in a small company, there's a pretty low probability that you'd actually find um, a group of people with all of these skills, which leads to a lot of outsourcing. Some of the stuff's pretty easy to outsource, like power and network connectivity. You can outsource to co-location companies like Exodus uh, or AboveNet, um, just like that. And I guess there's people who now claim that they'll run your database and your operating system for you reliably, and maybe they're getting better at that. Um, it seems tougher to... Uh, outsource having a good idea. <laughs> I guess you could go to McKinsey and say, I need an idea for a web service. In terms of the programming side, getting some kind of toolkit of software in and customizing it a bit, I guess our experience from watching people do this at RS Digita and to a lesser extent at MIT um, is that you need to have at least three skills on the programming team. So one person has to be a great engineer. So what is that? I mean, they don't have to be a fabulous engineer, but they at least have to know the fundamental principles of computer science, know how to debug stuff. What would happen if we got 1,000 users at the same instant? Um, so that skill, though, by itself isn't good enough. And as you've seen, probably, from a lot of tech-heavy services, um, you can have good technology without having a good uh, feel for the end user and the overall site experience. So it's nice to have somebody who is a programmer, but who has kind of a natural feel for what's a good web experience and will take pride in the overall service as developed. Um, and thirdly, you need one person who's organized and likes to communicate with the publisher. Usually you do have somebody who's paying for this, whose idea it was, who raised the money, and uh, you know they sort of appreciate it if every week or two they can get some kind of report on how things are going. So two or three of these skills can be combined into a physical body. I'm not saying that you have to uh, have three actual people, but I think if you don't have all three of these skills on your team, on your technical team, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, on the other hand, if you do have all three of these roles, then if you just need more programmer bodies, um, you can kind of throw them into the mix. The way I used to pose this is if every year the tools for building web services get better, like Microsoft front page keeps getting easier to use, how come the average site keeps getting worse? So I think it's because you know, these what you see is what you get desktop tools, the WYSIWYG tools, solve the wrong problem. They let you move stuff around on a page. They don't get into the issue of how are you dividing labor among authors, editors, publishers, information designers, graphic designers, and programmers. So let me give you a good example of what would make photo.net a much better site. So we had this big outline of articles that we'd like to see people write. It'd be nice, what, what, we, what we actually need, because we're looking at community authorship, is a way for people to sign up, 
to say, here, I want to write this particular article that fits into the uh, outline. And uh, then for somebody to uh, approve their having signed up, for them to submit an outline of the article, for the system to keep track of the editor's comments on the outline, uh, for them to then submit the uh, first draft, say, and again, uh, a way of storing comments and corrections. And then finally, when something is approved by the editor-in-chief to go live, then it automatically uh, goes from the system into the live site or it begins to be offered to users. So it's that kind of workflow, which is very different. Photo.net wants something completely different from the New York Times. The New York Times doesn't want to do that. First of all, they're not sure what they're going to write about. This is actually a problem. I, I read about this with um, Science and Verde. So Science was building a site for a nonprofit, well, sort of the green portal called Verde, which had tens of millions of dollars of money from Ted Turner, I guess. And uh, the, the company managed to tank. They went through all the money. They spent a whole lot of it on IT. And uh, the mismatch was shown because uh, the guys at Scient said to the Verde people, um, you know, you have to give us all your content at least three weeks in advance. And they said, well, you know, this is kind of a news site. Um, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I don't know how we can do that, you know? And then uh, the sign goes, well, that's how it's done. That's how it works in the internet world. And so the Verde guys, you know, showed them uh, the today's Wall Street Journal. They happened to have the hard copy paper, and they said, you know, when do you think that, you know, the author of this article got the thing submitted to the editor? And they said, oh, I don't know. The science people said, oh, probably, you know, a month ago. And they <laughs> said, well, <laughs> look, it's referring to events that only happened yesterday. So <laughs> that can't possibly be the case. So that, that shows this divide. But anyway, if you go to the New York Times, they don't want that. They don't want their readers. They, they don't know in advance what they want to write. And they don't particularly want uh, their random readers authoring content. They have hundreds of reporters worldwide, and they want to uh, just take content in from the reporters. But they do want some of the same approval and editing functions that we talked about on Photodon. So that shows you already that the workflow has to be customized on a per-publisher basis. You also want version control. You want to be able to go back and see um, all the versions of a document, depending on the edits. And you want scheduling of content. So I know people who run sites for AOL, and they're very concerned that you know at midnight, uh, suddenly the entire site changes in a consistent way, and there's a whole bunch of new content. Um, so is this tough to build? It's not that tough to build. It can't be that tough to build, because we make our students do it in two weeks. So here's a problem set from our course at MIT. Um, so we say, look, it's easy to build and maintain a website if one person does publishing, authoring, and programming, but to divide labor. So we tell the students, you have to support this workflow, that somebody logs in as a publisher and creates, we make them build a city guide to Boston, basically. Somebody logs in and builds uh, as a publisher and says there's going to be movies, dining, and news sections. Then somebody else logs in as an information designer and uh, specifies the navigation among these sections. Then somebody logs in as a programmer and uh, up and develops some templates and uploads them for a presentation of restaurant reviews or um, actor profiles. Uh, and then somebody logs in as an author, uh, uploads a couple movie reviews, it says, I think, two actor profiles. And then finally, somebody logs in as an editor and approves some of this stuff. Oh, and then we make them have uh, somebody, uh, an, a non-logged in user come and actually experience the site, although it's, you know, there's no actual files in the file system. This is all being done virtually from the database. So uh, a workflow system like this can be developed in two weeks by somebody taking three other classes. Um, so obviously, it's not that hard. There's various toolkits. Ours Digita distributes one with ACS, Content Repository, and then a Content Management System set of pages. But it turns out that it's almost never possible to get the workflow support right with a packaged application. That basically, you have to have some customization. And it really comes down to how hard is it to customize the stuff. So most organizations, I think, have found that even after they buy these commercial products, that the customization process is as expensive and painful, if not more so, than starting from scratch. Because 
Um, because these things are closed source, it's very hard to change the fundamental way that they work. Um, and a lot of organizations actually do. So I know a lot of companies that bought Vignette, uh, which came with a content management system and also some basic WebDB connectivity. And after about maybe six months, they'd chipped away so much at the uh, Vignette content management support that they were just using the raw web database connectivity system. So they paid a million dollars for you know, what they could have gotten for free at the Apache site, just downloading Apache and Mod Pearl or something. Uh, so they weren't too happy about that. They did get the content management system that they needed eventually, um, but they wrote it from scratch. Here's uh, some other perspectives on this. Forrester Research, which is local, just recently said that the, uh, the cost for a basic content management system commercially is $650,000, and they predicted that owner satisfaction will be short-lived. Uh, here's an Australian guy. Said, as tech internet technology advances, new things become suddenly possible. Just five years ago, it was almost impossible to waste a million dollars building a website. But modern 21st century internet technology means that any medium sized organization with web ambitions can now pour a seven digit sum of money straight down the hole almost instantly. <laughs> One of the easiest and most efficient ways to do this is to buy the wrong web content management system, or CMS. So anyway, uh, I'm pretty convinced that every web content management system out of the box is the wrong one. There may be some exceptions. I suppose if you built something for the New York Times, it could probably also be used by the Washington Post. So there are some, um, although people, I heard, I heard like a laugh, so <laughs> probably that shows what I know about the newspaper business. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, every organization is different, and therefore every organization probably needs a different content management system. So my recommendation is to start with something that's open source. So at least you won't be constrained. So I know Ars Digita has one. Uh, I have a feeling that Zope has some open source content management stuff underneath. There's probably others. Um, but don't expect these systems out of the box to solve all your problems. Now we're going to segue a little bit into some uh, software engineering for internet applications. And the four steps really are about uh, developing a data model first. So you have to be able to represent what is important to users and to the publisher. Um, step two is specifying the legal transactions. So what can people do to the data? Can they, how, how do they enter data into the system? How do they get it back out? Three is structuring the site into directories of URLs that call each other. So basically, it's specifying the page flow for the site. How does a user navigate through the site and get up to these transactions, like purchasing something or submitting a comment? Um, and finally, the fourth step is implementing those individual URLs. That's the least interesting step. Once you've got your data model and your transactions and your page flow defined, almost any competent programmer in almost any tool set can actually build you that web experience. You could build it all in COBOL if you wanted on a mainframe. But this is the part that people like to talk about, I guess, because it's easy to talk about. So people will get in a passionate debate about you know, Perl versus Visual Basic Active Server Pages. And it's just totally irrelevant, because if you've got these first three steps right, then the users will be perfectly happy uh, whether they're connecting to Perl pages or Visual Basic pages or Java server pages. And if you've got those first three steps wrong, then the users are going to be, they're not going to be mollified like that American Airlines site where we couldn't you know, back out of it and didn't have the information we wanted. Well, so what if they can say, oh, it's in broad vision, it's the latest and greatest technology? You know, who cares? So data model and page flow equals everything important. So I've actually had to sort of keep hammering on this. People say, you know, oh, Philip, you know, you're the Oracle guy, or you know, you're the AOL server guy, or they find some Java code in the ACS. They say, oh, you know, you're like Java hacker, or you're a Tickle hacker, because they find some Tickle code in the presentation layer. And it drives me insane, because you know, from the day one, we said, well, we want to have the right data model and the right page flow, and we want it to be available in um, you know, Microsoft Active Server Pages for people who like to uh, you know, have a big organization full of VB programmers, and we want to have it available in AOL Server Tickle, and we want to have it available in Java, so it can run right from the, well, the, the there was this built-in web server that Oracle kept promising that they finally delivered, so we wanted to have a one-tier system where you could just download ACS and uh, run it direct from Oracle without buying any web server. Um, but because uh, we were always focused on data model plus page flow, but people tend to zero in on the externalities. All right, so let's look at why are database management systems so important in this world. 
So these things were developed mostly for corporate accounting years and years ago. How is it that uh, the database management system has emerged 20 years later to be such an exciting tool for web development? And the key is that it's not about storing structured data. A database management system is not for managing data. If you want to just keep some structured data, you can do that in a spreadsheet program just fine. If you're the only person who's editing it, then um, you know, using Lotus 1, 2, 3 um, is a perfectly good way to keep your data. On the other hand, if you have multiple users simultaneously updating the data set, that's really where the relational database becomes useful. And actually, it's a good way to think about, I, I tell my students that the way to think about the relational database management system is as a spreadsheet program that multiple users can update. And because multiple users have to be able to update it, it no longer makes sense to have a graphical presentation of the spreadsheet and a mouse and keyboard interface. Instead, you have to think about you know, the database management system being all alone in a dark closet, and then you have uh, requests to insert stuff into tables being slipped under the door on little strips of paper. Um, and then if you want to get some data back, you put a request for, you know, give me all the employees uh, with salaries over X dollars, or all the users who posted more than 25 classified ads. And then, you know, the Oracle in its little closet will then write down uh, your results and s shove it back under the door on, on a sheet of paper. So really, um, that's what the database management system is all about. Uh, it, works on beha it can work on behalf of thousands of users at the same time, uh, which is something that Lotus 1, 2, 3 or Microsoft Excel can't do because uh, it's uh, got a user interface that only works for one user at once. How do you know if you've bought a database management system? There's a lot of confusion over this. I think it might have been the IBM guys, even before the relational database management system came out, who said that... Um, you needed the acid test, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So let's go through this a little bit. What does this mean to you? So if, you don't, if you're a business person, don't worry. This isn't too technical. And it only lasts for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so you can sleep. OK, atomicity. That says that you can tell the database to do, you can shove in four slips of paper with different kinds of commands under the closet door and say, if you have any problem with one of those strips of paper, then I want you to behave as if you'd never seen any of the four. So basically, it takes four transactions or four requests and yokes them together into a single transaction that either completes or it doesn't complete. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you have um, uh, an employee intranet site where you want to make sure that you have a person's a name and address and phone number and also a photograph of them. So you want to have a picture. Okay, so perhaps the picture and the uh, textual information are going into two separate tables in the database. So you can have those as two separate transactions, uh, two separate uh, statements in one transaction. And let's suppose that the hard disk, let's suppose that the textual information goes in fine, but something happens while transferring the photo or the hard disk drive fills up because you know, the person's really fat and their photo is enormous. So um, in that case, the database management system that gives you atomicity will unroll the entire transaction. So you won't be left with you know, 50,000 employees for whom you have a photograph and one employee for which you have a uh, sort of broken image icon or no image data. OK, so that's actually um, a nice feature. And it sort of segues a bit into consistency. Because one of the ways that your transaction can fail is if it violates a rule. So let me give you uh, a slightly different example. Let's suppose you have all these employees in your database. Um, and you have discussion forum comments. So you, know, you have a knowledge management system where users can ask questions and other employees can answer them. And uh, you know, then one day, you know, the dot bomb, you know, your company goes from dot com to dot bomb, and uh, you say, oh, I'm going to fire all these, so we have to fire 100 people. So, of course, you fire all the good programmers first because they're the most offensive. I remember this company called Wang. <laughs> Anybody here remember Wang? <laughs> I interviewed there for a job once. 
they had this word processor program that was very clever. It had it was a distributed computing environment where almost all the processing power was local in your terminal, but then they had a centralized hard drive so that you know four different people in a company could work on the same document. So it was the Wang word processor. And I, uh, I walked by, they had a cubicle farm, and there was this just fat guy sitting at his desk, and people said, oh, we don't talk to him because he's really nasty. And I said, well, you know, why does he work here? What, what has he done? And they said, oh, he built the Wang word processor <laughs> by himself. And I said, well, you know, it looks like he's playing uh, a computer game. Actually, the Wang word processor could also run a few pretty cool games. And, I said, so, uh, you know, who's working on the next version? And so they introduced me to this other floor where they had 50 people <laughs> with all the best managers and all the best credentials, and they were very smooth and nice to talk to. And as far as I know, they never actually were able to ship the new version. They, after years and years, they never shipped. But they actually fired the fat guy after a while. I remember that. They fired the fat guy. And when people would ask me, why did Wang tank? Because I worked there for a summer. I said, well, they fired the fat guy. <laughs> So let's suppose that the first people out the door uh, are the fat, uh, really good programmers. And what are you left with? Well, you're left with people who are pretty junior programmers. So you know, the executive comes down and says, look, I can't bear to see these 100 people's name on the employee database when we fire them all. So just delete them. So this novice programmer types a command, delete from employees table where you know, employee number is in this big list of the 100 people that got fired. <clears throat> well, if you've defined a rule that says if you have a discussion forum response that's tied to a user ID, that that must actually reference a real existing user, the database management system will say, no, you can't delete these users because that's going to leave all these orphaned postings in the discussion forum where we know what was said, but we don't know who said it. So you have to either get rid of all the discussion forum postings and the users at the same time or um, you know, leave them there and maybe change the state from you know, current employee to former employee. So that's consistency. So basically, companies like this, because you have a data set that evolves maybe over 25 years, and programmers come and go, and programmers make a lot of, mistake, a lot of mistakes. And um, imagine if every time you'd seen uh, a PC or Macintosh crash, that corporate data had become permanently corrupted. This is the kind of, I mean, because that's what programmers do. They write these programs that crash. And they write programs with errors, and they make conceptual mistakes, like thinking that it's OK to delete a bunch of rows from the employees table without thinking about the implications on other tables in the systems that refer to those employees. So a database management system with consistency enforcement gives you kind of a last line of defense against any kind of programming mistakes. Isolation means that two users can't see each other's half-completed transactions. So what does that mean? Let's say you're um, a personnel person, and you're looking at all the employees in, say, the Boston office of your company, and you're seeing your know, name, address, and photograph, name, address, and photograph. If somebody is in the midst of signing up to work for the company, and they're, they've uploaded their name and address but not the photograph, and they haven't committed their transaction, uh, you won't see sort of this half-completed record in your listing. It means that you won't see, you'll either see uh, if you started your transaction just before they started theirs, you won't see any of it at all. Durability means that once you commit a transaction, it's permanent. That if somebody spills Diet Coke into this computer and it's running Oracle, that you can always recover that transaction. So you might say, well, that's a pretty neat trick because that computer looks pretty small. I don't think it has more than one disk drive. Uh, that should give you a clue that you can't get durability if you have a very simple PC with only one disk drive. It's uh, something that the database management system makes easier, but you have to have a computer with a whole bunch of disks. So ACID, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Uh, Oracle does give you these guarantees. So does Microsoft SQL Server, um, IBM's DB2, a bunch of other databases that you might have heard of. Um, they're pretty expensive, but um, I don't know. Uh, they're expensive to operate. Let's suppose you get them for free. Uh, they require a fair amount of expensive and skilled care and feeding, but ultimately it's worth it. The final thing that they give you is <clears throat> declarative versus procedural programming. This is very important when dealing with data because programmers, most programs are procedural. So you tell the computer, do this, then do this, um, do this, do this, do this, step, 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 step. Those programs tend to have a lot of bugs. 
because for one thing, some parts of it are untestable. Historically, it's much buggier than a procedural, than a declarative um, computer language where you just tell the computer what you want. So in a relational database management system, you say, you construct a query that says, show me the users that have placed more than 25 classified ads, or show me the users who registered less than two months ago who've already placed 10 classified ads. Um, and you're not telling the database management system to look, whether to look in the users table first or the classified ads table first. You're not telling it how to do it. You're just telling it what you want the shape of the return data to be. Um, and those kind of programs historically are much, much more reliable. Um, and they're also easier for novices to write. So let's give an example. Raise your hand if you think that you've never written a declarative computer program. This man looks like an executive. Have you ever used Microsoft Excel? Sure. He says, sure. So he doesn't think he's ever written a declarative computer program, but actually he's probably written a fairly sophisticated spreadsheet financial model, which is a declarative programming language. You say, I want this cell to be the sum of these other three cells, and I don't care in which order you do that computation. So that opens up a lot of new opportunities for more people to program and for more reliable computer programs. 30 years ago, if you wanted to do a financial model, you would uh, pick up the phone and call down to your organization's programming department, and the COBOL or Fortran program would come upstairs, write down your assumptions, go back down, spend a day or two programming, and uh, then come back upstairs. But VisiCalc changed all that, and all of a sudden, people who were closer to the business problem were able to write reliable, accurate computer programs for themselves. So uh, there are different kinds of database management systems. Relational databases have dominated the market because they're very good at um, handling multiple users at the same time for concurrency. They're also good because um, you can isolate important data from programmers' mistakes. There are these things called object databases that have been sort of touted for the last 20 years. They never caught on, I think, because it's hard to figure out what the programmer did with the data. Whereas the relational database management system, you can keep a log of all the slips of paper that were sent under the door into the Oracle's closet. Um, and then if you know, all of a sudden you find that your company has gone from you know, 200,000 employees down to zero employees, you can go, <laughs> you can go and uh, look at the little strips of paper on the floor and uh, restore um, the uh, needed data and go and uh, chastise the errant programmer. So we'll torture people a little bit longer. There's three slides with actual code. Then we segue back into the high-level stuff again. Everybody should know some SQL. It's fun. It's happening. So this is like spreadsheet. And this was developed originally as a programming language for non-programmers. The idea was that business and marketing people would be able to uh, query a lot of data out themselves. OK, so how does, it, how does a relational database actually work? Let's suppose you're a publisher and you want to have a mailing list of all the people who've visited your site. So the first thing you do is you say create me a table called mailing list and I want to have two columns, email and name. So this gives you, you know, imagine uh, a uh, Excel program running with a narrow table of uh, name and email and you can have as many rows as you like in this table, one row per user. Okay, <clears throat> in this case it's not quite as powerful or forgiving as Microsoft Excel. Um, so you have to say, well, it can be up to 100 characters. You have to explicitly say how many characters you're going to have. Um, you can put in some integrity constraints right here. Not null. I don't want to have the email. I don't want to have, uh, this is an email spam list, so I don't want to have a row where I don't have an email address. You can also say primary key. This says no matter how much your programmers screw up, you can never have somebody on this list more than once, that the email address will be unique in the table. OK. And then for name, you just say var char 100. So that's a varying length character string up to 100 bytes with no constraints. So that means somebody could give you their email address and elect to remain anonymous by not giving you their name. OK, so then here's one of those little strips under the door that I was talking about. Remember, you have no way of typing at the system. So instead, you send it a little strip of paper saying, please insert into the mailing list table into these two columns, name and email, these two values, Philip Greenspun and Phil G at MIT.edu. Um, 
So let's say, so now you've got one table, one row in your system. Now all of a sudden the publisher comes down and says, well, I want phone numbers too. I want users to be able to give me their phone numbers. So you say, oh, well, instead of tearing down your whole application, you just alter the mailing list table and you add a phone number column up to 20 characters. So this is one of the nice things that IBM figured out. IBM developed the relational database management system initially uh, in their San Jose research lab. And they said, well, these database management systems that we've had have been pretty good, but they don't change very well with business requirements. It's hard to uh, change the data model as business, re business requirements expand and have your old applications work. So one of the nice things is if you have an application program that still thinks that all you're storing is name and email, a little strip of paper that says put Michael O'Grady and O'Grady at fastbuck.com into the database, it specifies the name and email column so the database management system will just put that row in and leave the phone number column blank. So here if you do a select star from the mailing list, that says select all the columns. So it gives you email, name, and phone number. Notice it gives you the two rows that we put in and blank phone numbers. The Philip Greenspun phone number is blank because that column didn't even exist at the time we inserted the row. And the O'Grady column is blank because we didn't specify anything for it. So it defaults to empty. Okay. Um, so you might live in a world where people have more than one phone number. In the old days, you had one phone number. And then in the 90s, people had you know, cell phones, beepers, home phones, and work phones. And I have a feeling that, um, actually, if you look at the old wildfire system, I don't know how many of you guys have ever played with wildfire. This was developed locally. It's a system that tries to get you back to where people were 100 years ago with the phone system. They said the phone system was actually a lot better 100 years ago. You pick up the phone and you say, you know, I want to talk to Joe Smith. And Mabel at the central office would say, oh, I think Joe's over at Dr. Fubar's house, so I'll connect you over there. Or, you, know, um, I, you know, he's out of town this week. So uh, anyway, but we don't live in that world yet where we can just talk to Mabel. So um, what if you need to store multiple phone numbers associated with each person? I was in Israel, and I met somebody with three cell phones. <laughs> all on his belt at the same time. So, you know, that's what you call a many-to-one relation, where there's many possible um, phone numbers for one user. And the way you model many-to-one relationships is with uh, two tables. So you have your mailing list table as before. You, you drop the table first to get rid of uh, your uh, extra column. You, create, you recreate it with just name and email as before. Then you create a separate phone numbers table with an email column so you know which user you're talking about. And you say this is not null and it references the mailing list. So what this is saying is I'm only going to store a phone number for somebody who's actually in the mailing list table. And that gives me the possibility of associating a name with the phone number. Um, you can say I want the number type and I can check with this integrity constraint whether it's in work, home, cell, or beeper. So I have four possible types of phone numbers, but again, I can have more than one per user. And then you have a phone number itself, which is constrained to be not null, because you don't want to have a phone number row if there's no phone number. OK, so now we try to insert into the phone numbers table. Notice we're not specifying the columns here. We're letting Oracle figure out that we mean the values correspond to the columns and the orders defined. So an email address, O'Grady at fastbuck.com, a work phone number, and a, uh, uh, the, the fact that it's a work phone number and then the phone number itself. So I hope there's nobody from Oracle here. Who's here from Oracle? Anybody? Oh, good. Nobody. Um, all right. So here's the world's greatest database management system. I wish I could find the scroll bar here. OK. So the world's smartest database management system says, Aura error 02291, integrity constraint, sys underscore c001080 violated, parent key not found. So what it's actually saying is, since we dropped the table and then recreated the mailing list table, that row with Scott O'Grady is no longer in there. So it says, well, what it should say actually is, you can't put a row into the phone numbers table unless the corresponding email, unless 
the corresponding email address exists in the mailing list table, but instead it says that you violated sys underscore c001080. This is why you can make a lot of money as an Oracle programmer. <laughs> okay, so we redo our inserts from the old application. Then we insert some phone numbers. Three of them work. The fourth one doesn't work. Again, Oracle doesn't tell you. I won't let you insert that in there because Bepper, because the uh, number type column must be one of the four following four values. It just says sys underscore c001079 violated. And you have to figure that out. Okay. So now we say, now we're doing what's called a join, where we're joining data from two different tables. So we're saying select everything from the mailing list table and the phone numbers table. So we select star, and remember we have three phone numbers in the database that we successfully inserted. And we have two people, Greenspun and O'Grady. So you might think that Oracle would give us, I would expect to get a two column report, uh, sorry, a two row report with one row for each person, and then their phone numbers uh, dangling off to the right hand side of the screen. Or maybe three rows, one for each phone number um, with the name of the user associated with that. But instead we've gotten six. So um, what's happened here? Any theories? Yeah, so what's this called? A what? Yeah, there's another term there. Cartesian product. Okay, so if you want to be a database instructor at a community college, you need to know that term. If you don't, all you need to know is that, hey, this stupid database took each row in the mailing list table and matched it up with every possible row in the phone numbers table. So I have Greenspun and O'Grady's work number, <laughs> O'Grady with O'Grady's work number, Greenspun with O'Grady's home number, every possible combination. And you might say, well, that's not so bad. I can wade through those six and pick out the ones that I want. But I have to remind you that on a typical database management system, you know, each table is going to have closer to a million rows. So if you have an output of 10 to the 12th items, you're going to be looking at it for quite a long time. Not to mention the fact that your computer will be grinding away a bit. Okay, so what you actually wanted to do is select star from those two tables where the email column in the mailing list table is equal to the email column in the phone numbers table. And that gives us the three column report that we envisaged last time. This is the last slide of code, you'll be pleased to know. So that gives us three rows selected. So let's say you fired all your fat programmers and you're left with some New punk out of MIT. So he says, oh, well, this database management system cost a lot of money and it's got really impressive documentation. And the boss told me to delete some phone numbers, so I'll just type delete from the phone numbers table, semicolon, I'll hit carriage return, and then I'll wait for it to prompt me, you know, which phone numbers that I want deleted. Well, that's not actually how Oracle works. Here it says three rows deleted, and if there had been 300 million rows in that table, it would have said 300 million rows deleted. <laughs> so fortunately, the guys at Oracle actually have no faith in human reliability. So whenever you're typing at an Oracle shell client, you're actually in the middle of a transaction. And remember we said that nobody else in the database management system gets to see your half-completed transactions. So until somebody types commit, the database is actually untouched as far as all the other users can tell. So. Um, if you type roll back, if this guy says, oops, better roll back, then uh, you find that uh, you can then say delete from phone numbers where email equals fill g at MIT to edge you. So that you've learned all of SQL. This is actually one of the beauties of the language is that it's pretty simple. So you can create a table, you can insert rows into the table, you can select them back out, you can update, and you can delete. So all the power comes from combinations of these statements slightly cleverer ways of doing data models. Um, it's a pretty darn simple system. Um, I guess I'll get into one more little bit of item which is usually sort of technical. Some people sort of wonder, well, why has Oracle taken over this whole world of the internet? They have these billboards, you know, 99% of internet applications run with Oracle, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, the main reason is we get back to that isolation issue in the ACID test, the I in ACID. So the way that most database management systems do isolation is with locks. So if I'm reading from the database, you can't write to the database. If you're writing to the database, I can't read from the database. And this is pretty, uh, particularly when combined with uh, novice programmers, this is a pretty deadly combination. So let me give you an example. If you work at a big, uh, let's say there's a website and a marketing person comes and tells this 22-year-old programmer, hey, I need a report showing all user activity for the last month queried from the database. So the programmer comes up with this query that's going to take two hours to run that goes and looks at every table in the database and the user's table and produces this huge report. That's fine, except for that entire hour, nobody will be able to write to the database. So nobody can enter a new order. Nobody can register as a new user. Probably a lot of you guys have had the experience of going to a website where everything works perfectly as you're reading from the database, because usually people can read simultaneously. So while this big query is going on, you're still able to read. And then right at the point where you want to register or place your order, <clears throat> you find that the Netscape uh, icon is just spinning and spinning and spinning. It actually would, if you were willing to wait an hour or two, you know, it would probably finish. And this is actually a feature, not a bug. But uh, it's a feature that a lot of people didn't appreciate. So there's ways of working around this with Microsoft SQL Server and IBM's DB2 and the other competitors to Oracle, but most people decided that it was easier to just get Oracle instead of having to train their programmers to think differently. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit. So that's all pretty boring. A lot of you guys might say, well, anybody can build Amazon.com. You know, that site was built six years ago, um, seven years ago. The world has moved on. Um, why is it interesting to know how to build a database-backed web service? Um, well, the web is, the web is going to be made up of database-backed web services. But I think that, on balance, people are right, that it's no longer very interesting. You know, it's something that you have to have as a skill. You have to know how to build something like photo.net or amazon.com. But fundamentally, that's not the engineering challenge that's going to be put before the best engineers for the next 10 years. So what does a Nouvelle Internet application look like? Well, let's look at photo.net. This took seven years to build. People can ask questions like maintaining photo quality while publishing on the web. This will be interesting. Please, please help me. I'm appealing to anyone who can hear me. This is a new user, I think. <laughs> anyway, a user can ask a question. All these other users can answer the question. This user responds. I can sort of check in to see what this user is all about. Looks like she just joined up yesterday. Here's her personal home page. She's uploaded, uh, oh, she hasn't uploaded any photos yet. She's posted a couple questions or a question and a response. This looks like a pretty sophisticated application and it took a long time to build. But maybe this is actually a more advanced application. So this took an hour to build. So this is the old Bill Gates personal wealth clock that queries the US Census Bureau to find out what the population is right now. It queries NASDAQ to find out how much Microsoft stock is trading for right now. Does the appropriate math to fill, find out how much Bill is worth and then prints out your personal contribution. If you want to know what God thinks about money, just look at the people he gives it to. <laughs> Send that one to your venture capital friends. <laughs> anyway, this site is more interesting than photo.net in a way because it's using the Census Bureau as an object, and it's invoking a method on that object to pull out some state information like what the population is right now. Um, similarly, the web server is going back behind, behind our backs. This web server is going off to the NASDAQ site to get a Microsoft quote. So that's a more advanced application. So what does it mean to be a Nouvelle Internet application? Well, it means, first, first, first of all, that perspective of object-oriented programming. Now, if you're not a very thoughtful engineer, you might think that object-oriented programming means that you use common list object system, or C++, or Java, or C-sharp, to produce a web page. 
that you know a web request come in comes in and you build a big collection of objects in memory and then you finally return the page and tear all your objects down so that's sort of a trivial way of looking at object oriented programming i think a more interesting way of looking at object oriented programming with the web is to consider what an original object was in the computer world it was a way of abstracting and encapsulating um, capability. So you have this web service, like the Census Bureau, that has state and storage, but it won't let me get in there directly. The Census Bureau isn't giving me arbitrary access to all their programs. In fact, I don't even know how they've implemented their thing. Um, I can only touch or query that state via advertised methods, which are the URLs. So for example, oh, we don't have the URL here. Address bar? Hmm, okay, interesting. Um, anyway, it looks like the URL is slash CGI bin slash pop clock. So that's basically my only way into the Census Bureau, and that's just like calling a method in, um, you know, an object in Java or C++. So, and the arguments to those methods are the form variables of form submissions. So you look at the web as a distributed computing environment where each web service is an object. All right, so a lot of people might say, well, that pop clock <clears throat> is dealing with these objects that aren't very cooperative. In fact, um, about five times in the last five years, I've had to go edit the code for that application. So it took an hour to write, and it's taken me probably another two hours to maintain over the years because those sites like the Census Bureau and the NASDAQ server are, aren't trying to return their results in a structured machine-readable format. In other words, they're returning their results in, wrapped in an HTML page designed to look good to human beings, and the nugget of information that I want is buried in all this annotation. So I have to write these programs that look for patterns and try to pull the data out. And in fact, oftentimes, uh, their attempt to make the site, their site look better breaks my code. So there's this thing that you've probably heard about called XML. People used to say this, I'm building my site on XML technology and I'm going to make all this money because it's a cool technology. And I would say, well, you know, I'm going to build my site on the technology of comma-separated values files, which, you know, they're, it's even better than XML because you not only have structured data, but there's 100 million desktops worldwide where people have a program, I, I Lotus 1, 2, 3, or Excel, capable of reading and writing comma-separated values files. So XML is really not any more or less powerful than uh, comma-separated values files. XML is not a programming language and it doesn't solve the complete problem because it doesn't really say anything about how data are to be represented. So for example, uh, trivial stuff like prices. XML, doesn't, XML gives you the opportunity to develop um, tags like price. So you can put your price in between uh, less than price, greater than, and then a slash price. But you know, one organization, like a multinational company, might decide, oh, well, when, we're never going to use the price tag by itself. We're going to always have tags like price in dollars um, or price in francs. And somebody else could decide, oh, well, it's a, you know, I'm in France and this is the only country that matters, so I'm going to have, I'm just going to use price and it'll always be in francs. Um, it gets even more complicated when you have things like arrays. How do you represent a list? or a group of 200 items. Um, there's no obvious way to do that in XML, um, so you need a certain amount of social agreement and standardization. So the first one was something proposed by Microsoft but standardized by the web consortium called SOAP, Simple Object Access Protocol. <coughs> so I'm not gonna bore you with it too much, but you can read about it at your leisure. But it's a way of having a web service grab data from another web service and being able to at least read the basics, be able to read a number, be able to read an array, be able to um, supply arguments to a function. <clears throat> um, the world becomes friendlier for distributed computing if objects are self-describing. So there's a standard called WSTL, um, which again was proposed by Microsoft but is now standardized. Um, so basically, uh, what do they say about it here? Well, it stands for Service Description Language, and the idea is the Census Bureau could issue some WSTL saying, these are my methods, 
like CGI bin pop clock. These are the arguments that you have to supply, and this is what I'm going to give you back in return. So it's a way for the Census Bureau or Photo.net or any other web service operator to describe in a machine-readable fashion what the service can do for other programs. And that's fine if you know that Photo.net is the place to go if you want to see a recent list of uh, cameras for sale by users or uh, questions about photography. But if you don't have a way of discovering those resources, you might be kind of stuck. So there's this initiative called UDDI. It's the only one of which I'm aware. I don't know how far it's really gotten. But it's an attempt to have a registry where people can park their WSDL and say, OK, I'm registering my stock quote service here. And if you want stock quotes, here's who I am, and here's how you get them from me. Anyway, the hyperlinks are all there. <clears throat> but I just wanted to show you, this is what you actually need to turn the web into a distributed computing environment. Instead of these monolithic services where you sign up, and you're owned now by Amazon.com, and you know, the rest of the internet is elided and, in fact, hidden from you, um, I think the world's going to be a little more fluid now with people getting information. When you get a web page, you might end up with, uh, regularly with information that comes from four or five different services. And this is the infrastructure that makes it happen. First, you need a way for these <clears throat> non-trusted computers to talk to each other. And it really is essential that it not be something like enterprise Java beans or the other um, protocols that have been developed that require everybody to use the same programming languages and that require everybody to trust each other because that just doesn't happen even within the same organization. It often doesn't happen. Um, so there's these new standards like SOAP that basically say, OK, you're going to allow HTTP access, which is what they're uh, punching through their firewalls anyway, and you're going to get data back in XML format. And this is the, these are the barriers, the abstraction barriers that we put between web services. And like I said, finally, it will only really work when we have things like UDDI. So for example, um, your corporate intranet can know uh, all the places to look to find places to book uh, airline tickets. You know, and the more you talk about computer systems and languages, you just sit there and I, I think I was teaching intro programming at MIT in 6001 and it's about halfway through some lecture about three different ways to implement an object system and I thought, you know, is there anybody in this world except for a handful of professional commonalist implementers that needs to know this information? But you know, it's not the kind of thing you want to then relate out to the students in front of you. <laughs> That's a bit about how I feel, but we're almost done, I promise. OK, so there's the world of Java and J2EE. And there's plenty of advertisements out there that say you can't have a good website unless you have J2EE. So what does it do? What does J2EE do that a standard web programming environment <clears throat> doesn't do. So what, what you might ask, well, what's a standard web programming environment? A standard web programming environment, I guess, would be Perl um, with some SQL queries going to a relational database management system in the back end. So you'd have some Perl code with some HTML and some SQL queries, or maybe a Visual Basic Active Server page. Um, so <clears throat> the real difference with J2EE, if you use the whole system, they have these enterprise Java beans, they're called, and then something called container manage persistence, plus you have to buy this application server like WebLogic, which provides you the container manage persistence. And voila, you're no longer writing SQL code anymore. So that SQL tutorial I just gave you, now you can say, well, you really wasted my time, Greenspun, in addition to boring me, because with EJB, I don't have to write SQL code anymore. <clears throat> so what does it mean? Java is this big system that has objects. So you create a bunch of objects, you send messages from object to object, and that's how you program. And it's never <clears throat> actually been very powerful on the web, and it's never been that popular for building web services, I think, because at the end of the day, people always wanted to store their data in not an object database that would make those objects persistent, which means that they persist from page load to page load. And you need persistence on the web, because remember that <clears throat> if a, the web protocol is stateless, every connection is brand new, but the user doesn't realize that. So in other words, if they put something in their shopping cart, uh, on the next page, they want to see that, in fact, uh, their shopping cart is there and all the items they put in are there. So for that, you need persistence, something on the server that remembers from page click to page click. And remember, the user may you know, fall asleep for nine hours and then come back in the morning and finish his or her session. 
you need this persistence. So as long as your persistence is in a database management system like we just showed you with tables and rows and columns, then Java really isn't, or in any other object-oriented language, isn't really very useful <clears throat> because it has these objects instead of uh, dealing with tables as a form of persistence. So ultimately, if all you're doing is leading up to an SQL query or an SQL update, then it really doesn't matter what programming language you use. It'll be, you'll be about equally effective in Visual Basic, in Perl, in Tickle, in Lisp, in Java, so what. Okay, so <clears throat> J2EE with the container managed persistence tries to move uh, forward a bit in terms of abstraction. You tell the programmers, all you have to think about is objects. You can say, here's an object, maybe it's a user or it's a shopping cart, and uh, we will make it persistent for you. So in other words, you just tell us which part of this object have to be remembered from page load to page load, and we'll do whatever SQL queries and uh, updates are necessary. Well, the problem with that is that if you buy yourself a computer, you can do 200 million updates per second of a slot in an object. So it's perfectly reasonable to have a little loop that runs around, and for every time it goes around the loop, do another update to a slot in an object. Well, <clears throat> but on the other hand, if you have a $100,000 Oracle server, it can only do about 200 updates per second. So it's a factor of a million slower. So if somebody's given you an object to use and not told you, oh, by the way, uh, a bunch of these methods are going to be persistent and have implications of going out to the database and back, <clears throat> your application could run a million times slower than you expect. So it gives you more abstraction, but now you, they've hidden from the fact, from programmers, the fact that a bunch of SQL queries and updates are going out to the database. So it might let you program a little faster than you think. <clears throat> it might let you, um, it might result in an application that was unbelievably slow for reasons that you found hard to understand. And I guess if you're a vendor of all this enterprise stuff, you might not think that was bad. The software is all licensed for CPU. And uh, notice that the whole standard was developed by Sun Microsystems, which uh, they make a lot of money on a 64 processor machine. Okay. So what if you spend millions of dollars on something like WebLogic and all the hardware associated with supporting this additional abstraction for programmers? You know, is that better than just using Microsoft Active, Active Server Pages that comes bundled with Windows? Okay, well here's one of Sun's poster children. It's the John Deere tractor site. Not the whole tractor site, which is static HTML, but the job thing. So let's say we want an information systems job. in Massachusetts, working on special technologies. That sounds pretty good for a lot of folks in this room. All right. <clears throat> so I'm really happy now with J2E. They're using a servlet. You know, conceptually, this site is just completely um, it's completely ignored all the principles of searching and user interface. There's no query basically that you can type into a search engine like Google that results in a page like this. You type something, it gives you the closest matches that it can find. So, you know, if there's other jobs in Massachusetts or jobs in nearby states that relate to special tech, oh, also look, we, they broke the back, back button. We backed up and it eliminated all of our choices. So anyway, this is just, on every dimension, one of the worst possible internet services. If you want to see what jobs are available, you'll have to probably make thousands and thousands of mouse clicks before you get to them. Uh, no indication of how many jobs there are. Actually, what I would do if I'd programmed this was put a number after accounting, showing how many, you know, if this page is being generated by your fancy J2EE code, well, how come it can't tell me how many accounting jobs there are overall? And similarly for these states, why can't it show me how many jobs are in each state? So it's just a horrible, horrible website for reasons that have nothing to do with how it's implemented. Oh, I can't back out of it either. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Let's look at Netflix.com. I don't know how many of you guys, anybody here a Netflix customer? Okay, so this is a pretty cool service where you pay them a fixed monthly fee. Um, you guys can see what I'm like. Let's see my account. I'll log in here. 
So you pay them a fixed monthly fee, and then you tell it, these are the DVDs that I would like to see. And then they mail them to you. So here, for example, we can see my shipping status. So we see all the DVDs I have right now at home. So I have Cozy Found Tutti, Love for Three Oranges, Men All Let's Go, Cunning Little Vixen, Attila, Bizet's Carmen. It turns out that this collection of movies results in some domestic discord. There are people who do not like opera. <laughs> sometimes closer to home than you might think. So uh, anyway, here's my rental queue. Seven Samurais coming soon, uh, a bunch of French movies. That'll be fun, a movie about Marc Chagall. Anyway, hey, it stars Marc Chagall and Vincent Price. Is that true? Well, anyway, um, it's a pretty cool service. It works real nicely. And if you look carefully up at the address line, you see the words .asp. Oh my god. What a bunch of losers using Visual Basic. Well, now this site sucks. I'm not going to use it anymore. <laughs> so seriously, you know, Netflix is 100 times better than that John Deere thing. They thought much more carefully about the user experience. And if Visual Basic enabled them to prototype it quickly, <clears throat> um, who are we to say that uh, they made a bad technology choice? It seems to scale just fine. I'm sure they have a lot more users than the John Deere job posting service, and <laughs> the site's been quite slow. Let's look at some other good things. Um, here's a guy who has a site called Jargon Free Web, where what you do, let's take a bit of my writing and feed it into this. So we take the RS digit emission statement, which I wrote a while ago. at about 2 in the morning, of course, as I do all of my writing because I have to spend the days programming. All right, click. Oh, I guess that's on the editing window. All right, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's start here. Yeah. Okay, we'll cut and paste that. Sorry for the slowness here. Submit. Okay, so that was fast. Jargon score one. Very likely editors will read it and perhaps use the information given it has real news value. Good job. Um, whoops. Yeah, ah, ah. All right, let's go back to the home page. Notice the Ars Digita site does what Jacob Nielsen suggests, upper left-hand corner logo. Click on it, you get to the page. OK, so let's pull this out, see how we do here. OK. So here now we have the Ars Digita homepage text. Hmm. <laughs> Looks like we've gone up to six. Put it in the bottom of your birdcage and start over. <laughs> so it's picked out some words here, leader and solutions. <clears throat> it seems everyone is a leader. Trying to find a press release without the word is like trying to find a Diet Coke in a Pepsi plant. <laughs> Face it, chances are you're not the leader, so stop kidding yourselves, you're not fooling anyone. <laughs> solution, the most overused word in press releases today. Dog food bowls are pet feeding solutions. <laughs> Chairs are sitting solutions. Leave the solutions to chemistry class and say exactly what it is you do. All right, so that's a pretty good site. Um, what's it written in? I don't know. Do we care? It was fast. It entertained us. It did the job. Here's a brilliant site. This is one of my favorite sites. <coughs> this is done using a Macintosh and Perl, which is not exactly what most people would think of as you know the best technology ever. This is a guy who hooked up the ELISA program 
to AOL Instant Messenger and then invited people to chat <laughs> on AOL. <clears throat> so here's 58. Um, Hi, what seems to be your problem, says Eliza. 58 says, I'm just looking for random people to talk to. Tell me more about that. Um, I like to talk to random people from all around. It is fun. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. Tell me more about that. Let's, let's talk about you. Where do you hail from? You're not really talking about me, are you? <laughs> for those of you who don't remember, Eliza was this program written in the 60s that uh, is a non-directive uh, therapist. So, yes, I am. Please go on. Well, in order to talk about you, you tell me about yourself. Suppose I did tell you, what would that mean? <laughs> um, does talking about this bother you? No, I enjoy it. What about you? Are you saying no just to be negative? Um, let's see. Does this make you feel unhappy? No, it makes me feel good. Why not? I don't know. Don't you really know? <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is, it gets that Eliza always responds. Um, it was nice chatting with you. That is interesting. Please continue. <laughs> you are interesting, he says to the Pearl scripts. But I must now go. I have other things, other things to do. Does it please you to believe I am interesting? Yes, it does. Bye for now. Please go on. If you message me again today without me messaging you first, I'll warn you. What does this speculation lead to? Ha, huh, you have a 5% warning level. And finally, AOL says, AOL Eliza says, we were discussing you, not me. <laughs> so that's kind of my comment on uh, J2DEE, ultimately. Um, you know, the interesting sites, Delta.com, I think, I looked at their pages, and they seem to have some Java stuff in the URL. Not a very interesting site. Slashdot, as some of you guys may know, is some big monstrosity of Perl, um, but very interesting behavior. Um, if you want to learn more about J2E, one place you can go is the Ars Digital Systems Journal, which uh, is a real interesting article written by some guy from the DC office, um, an old MIT fraternity chum, I think, of Jin's. So he talks about all the things that have been rolled together and given the name J2EE. Basically, J2EE isn't actually anything new. It's just old stuff or stuff that was developed over five years that was rolled together and given a name. Um, there's also an article about Enhydra, which is an application server. Um, and actually, you can get container-managed persistence. You, it used to be that the only way to get container-managed persistence was to pay you know, $50,000 per CPU to some company like WebLogic or IBM WebSphere. But you can now get it. Um, it's the French who will give this to you. There's a company called JBoss in Silicon Valley, which is a standalone startup company. Um, it doesn't say whether they're the leader or not. Maybe we shouldn't use this. <laughs> There's just world-class J2E technologies and open source. Anyway, um, so a bunch of French guys started this company out in Silicon Valley, and it works quite nicely. A bunch of big French companies like Boulle, the old Honeywell mainframe company, and France Telecom developed a system called Jonas, which is um, an open source uh, kind of thing. Let's see who else uses it. Yeah, France Telecom's R&D division in Enria. Um, so is it interesting? Well, there are organizations that use this stuff successfully. It's kind of nice to be able to program everything in Java because most university graduates at least know the syntax of the language, so that could give you, you know, a day or two head start over using something else. Um, you know, and we thought it was interesting enough a couple years ago to plan a 100% Java version of ACS with the presentation layer in Java because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Oracle promised a built-in web server to go with the 815 release of the database. They actually slipped it to 817, so uh, we ended up slipping our implementation till last fall. So I guess as of last September or October, you could download ACS Java. You can still download it now, ACS 3.4 Java. ACS 4.0 Java just came out in the final release form um, a week or two ago. So you can use Java. We're not going to tell you that 
you shouldn't use Java, um, but it's not very interesting, and I don't think that historically the interesting sites have not been built in Java, and I don't see that trend really changing <coughs> for whatever reason. Uh, all right, what about Microsoft.net? So these Microsoft guys, Microsoft hired half the Carnegie Mellon faculty. Um, it turns out that these people didn't realize that Pittsburgh sucked. So Microsoft came there and pointed this out to them, and they all quit their jobs as CS faculty. At, um, they've, they've gotten a few people from other schools. My friend Daniel quit his job at Stanford to become a Microsoft research person. But they had a lot of success in Pittsburgh, uh, as you might ex expect. So they drained out uh, the CS faculty of the number three school in computer science. And uh, they also hired a lot of MIT and Stanford PhDs. And they built this thing called .NET. So what's it all about? <clears throat> well, what does Java give you compared to um, a really old-style pr primitive language um, like C or, I guess, Fortran 77 or something in the old days? So what you get is you get automatic storage allocation and garbage collection. In other words, if a programmer needs to create a data structure, a big problem with C programs is that programmers need to create temporary data structures so they allocate them and then either the program exits in, in some unexpected way or uh, the programmer just forgets, but those structures never get deallocated, so the programs just get bigger and bigger. So even operating systems like Solaris have memory leaks, and the longer that they run, the more uh, memory that they leak, and eventually you have to reboot the machine. Um, or uh, also you've probably noticed memory leaks in Netscape, so you're running Netscape on your PC and it starts running worse and worse and worse, and you have to quit the program and restart, <coughs> which gets rid of all the memory leaks. Okay, the second thing that Java gives you is, um, oh, so, J so Java gives you automatic storage allocation. You allocate storage, and the computer system notices when you're no longer using that storage and reclaims it. So there's an algorithmic way of finding stuff that provably you aren't using anymore and uh, scavenging it and putting it back into the free space. It gives you a secure execution environment for mobile code. So if you want to grab code from somebody else, like take code from a website and run it on your local PC, Java gives you some guarantees about what that code can and can't do on your system. Um, the enterprise Java Bean claim is that you can plug together lots of unrelated software. And it, hasn't actually, it doesn't actually seem to have been true. In other words, I don't think there's, there's not a huge market in Java Beans that go from company to company or even within companies. But that is at least the claim, that there's some infrastructure there that lets uh, people reuse code more across the organization. They give you better support for modularity and abstraction. So basically, the computer doesn't need modularity or abstraction. It's perfectly happy with a billion instructions all in a row. But human beings usually have trouble keeping more than, say, seven things in their heads at one time. So uh, object systems like Java let you encapsulate a whole bunch of behavior in one place whittle it down to methods, and you don't have to worry about what goes on inside the black box. Well, Oracle is a great example of tremendous power from black box abstraction. It sits in its closet. You tell it to add stuff to tables. It goes and does it. You're not really sure how. So Microsoft.net gives you all of these features pretty much with any computer language. So you're no longer limited to just Java. OK, so that's one thing. And you, we're gonna, in the next slide, we're going to address why you might care. So why not just program in Java all the time? Uh, if you're a programmer nerd, you might be interested to know that .NET lets you create subclasses across languages. So you can have a bunch of um, egghead, pie-in-the-sky programmers off in their ivory tower creating a bunch of objects using C Sharp or Eiffel or Java or something. And then you can have a frontline Visual Basic scripter saying, well, that's almost what I need, but not quite. So I'm going to create a subclass in Visual Basic of that C Sharp class. So that's something that I don't think has ever been doable before. Corba, I don't think, would let you do that. So this is kind of an interesting innovation. They have a security model and this thing called custom attributes. So if you want container managed persistence, you can implement it with custom attributes. You can say a custom attribute of this method is that whenever, whenever anybody calls it, I want you also to update the database. Another custom attribute that you can do is you can say, I'm going to build this whole system and have all my methods be public. But by the way, I'm adding custom attributes so nobody can call these methods 
unless it's code that's been signed by me or code that's been signed by somebody I trust. You can also say, nobody gets to call this method unless they have you know, write permission to a particular file in the file system. So you can limit in a very interesting way who gets to do what on the computer system. The other thing that the Java guys never really figured out, that Microsoft did figure out, is that code doesn't always plug together. Let's say somebody, let's say somebody at Morgan Stanley gives me an enterprise Java bean and I'm using it. Um, so that Java bean deals with prices in French francs. So I use it for a whole bunch of time. And then, um, well, I build my system one day, and all of a sudden, the French franc doesn't exist anymore, and now it's all euros. So now this enterprise Java bean is still working with my code. The methods are still there. The arguments are still there. But the meaning has all been changed. They've upgraded the version, and now it's dealing with uh, euros instead of francs. So all of a sudden, my trading programs go crazy. Um, they think that you know the bargains of the century are now available over in France. Everything's a sixth of the price that it used to be. Um, well, Microsoft says, if you're going to plug these things together, you really need to carry around, say, version information, what assemblies the component depends on. They thought much more carefully about how software actually plugs together. Plus, they came up with a new computer language to piss off Sun. Um, <laughs> uh, so basically, they had a bust up with Sun, so they said, uh, we're going to come up with a new computer language called C Sharp, and it is actually somewhat better than Java. Mostly, it's just different. Um, but it is a bit better. One big area where it's better for those of you who program in Java, <clears throat> in the old original object-oriented languages like Smalltalk, everything was an object. You could treat all. You could send a message to, you know, uh, an object that was representing a person, or you could send a message to a number and say, "Print yourself." Um, so you know, the number didn't have very interesting behavior, or a string didn't have very interesting behavior, but it, it could be dealt with. You could have a list of objects, and one of those items in the list could be a string or a number. Well, it turns out, unless you're a brilliant implementer, this kind of flexibility can be a little bit inefficient. So there was a temptation in a lot of computer languages that had object systems. Uh, Common Lisp is an example. Java is an example to have primitive data types that don't really work quite as well with uh, <coughs> primitive data types that can't be treated as objects. Um, so in Java, for example, you can have an int, which is a little integer, or you can have a big int, which is an object that's an integer. So the int object can you know, print itself and maybe put on a list with a bunch of other things. And the little int is the one that's fast. So in micro Microsoft, they have better compiler developers um, than Sun did. So they managed to say, well, we've come up with a way that this stuff can be just as fast. And if you need to, um, the primitive data types can be treated as objects. So that, gets rid of a lot of programming complexity. Most people would say, well, you know, I like this not .NET stuff. It seems technically very advanced, but I want to sell my soul to Microsoft. So basically, HP, Intel, Microsoft, and IBM, which is not on the list for some reason, have <clears throat> been trying to push all this stuff through as a standard with ISO. And I guess they've started with the European something <coughs> Computer Manufacturers <coughs> Association. Anyway, so they've submitted all this for standardization. So if you had infinite programming resources and an infinite hatred of Microsoft, you could say, well, I'm going to download all the standards from ECMA, and I'm going to just build stuff on top of Linux that will imp implement .NET. Um, and that would be perfectly legal. As a practical matter, you may have to wait probably. I mean, you'll have to wait till this summer to get the beta 2 version of .NET. But Probably, that's probably the first version where you'd be wise to launch a public service off of, so that'll be about three months. I personally predict, by looking at how Jonas and JBoss lag the commercial uh, EJB execution environments, it might be another year or two before you get free open source stuff. But um, for the moment, you could program on Windows if you had to. Oh, the other cool thing they have is a development environment. It's very nice, like Visual C++, but any language can plug into it. So there's ways for all these different developers to, like if you want to write a Lisp compiler, you don't have to write the whole development environment. You can plug it right into uh, their Windows system and get their debugger and so forth. So why should you care? <clears throat> should you care about .NET or J2E for that matter? Um, but particularly the .NET story fundamentally over J2E is relevant if computer languages matter. 
So some people would say no. Some might say, well, Java is everything. If you have Java, you don't need anything else. Um, it's the apotheosis of computer programming, and uh, that's all we need. Well, you know, we're in year seven of the Java revolution. How do you guys feel about it? Is everybody here perfectly satisfied with his or her computer? No? I met Anthony Hopkins last week, and I asked him if he had an internet account. And he said, not only did he not have an internet account, but somebody gave him a laptop computer once, and he found it so frustrating that he broke it in half. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, Anthony Hopkins is not a Java believer. <laughs> um, so, after seven years of Java, why do computers still suck? I think it's because Java doesn't create any opportunity to write new programs, and it doesn't create any opportunity for new programmers. In other words, <clears throat> all of our students at MIT can program in Java. Um, they take 6170, which is the software engineering first course, and they, we don't teach them Java, but they use it to complete their assignments. So, <clears throat> um, but you know, they're all people who are capable of programming in C. They're capable of programming in Lisp. They're capable of programming in Fortran. They're capable of programming in these older computer languages. Whereas there's millions of people who program in VisiCalc and its descendants, like Excel and Lotus123, who were not capable of programming in Fortran or COBOL or C or Java. So basically, things like declarative languages, like the spreadsheet environments, and like SQL, they create revolutions in terms of the number of people who can write code and the kinds of new applications that can be developed. Scripting languages are kind of in the middle. There's an awful lot of Visual Basic developers who don't really call themselves Visual Basic developers. They call themselves you know, business people or customer service people or whatever. They have some job, but they've also picked up a book on Visual Basic or a book on Perl and a book on Tickle, and they've written some web scripts. And the entire web, the innovation of the web, seems to have mostly been driven by these folks. Now, there's professional programmers who are also behind the scenes in terms of making you know, the websites that can handle 100 million hits a day. You don't want to undersell the efforts of, say, the programmers at Oracle Corporation who made the database. But in terms of the people who are responsible for implementing the service idea and the user experience, an awful lot of the time uh, it was done in scripting languages. Even at impressive companies, actually. There's a woman here from Cisco, and I had a presentation from the guy who ran Cisco Web Service. And um, <clears throat> You know, you could have laughed at him for not using J2EE, because at the time he gave the presentation, you know, the entire Cisco website was done with Perl CGI, which is the simplest and sort of least efficient way of building dynamic web services. Um, but you know, he was selling $3 billion a year worth of merchandise off of those Perl scripts. So really, if he had to buy some bigger than necessary computers, um, I, there was no reason to laugh at him. So scripting languages are useful. On the heavy-duty programmer side, it turns out that if you ask computer scientists, they will tell you that Java is not the apotheosis, that Java has some nice features from research computer languages of 20 years ago, um, but that there's a lot more out there. There's a system called Eiffel, which uh, was developed by some French guys, I guess. And uh, <laughs> Eiffel has a better object system than Java. It also has things called invariants, preconditions, and postconditions. So you can say, before this piece of code is called, I want the following things to be true. After this piece of code runs, it better be the case that this other thing is true. And then things like invariance, like you could say, the bank balance has to be the sum of all previous additions and with, uh, withdrawals. So with uh, systems like Eiffel, you can actually generate much, much more reliable systems. And actually, Microsoft.net supports some of this stuff with any language, because you can add custom attributes uh, to implement invariants, preconditions, and postconditions on, say, Visual Basic uh, objects. There's also ML. There's a language called ML that understands how types coerce into each other, how an integer can become a floating point number if added to another floating point number, um, how um, data flows through computer programs at compile time. So it can do things like figure out, on the web, most of the time you're dealing with strings. You're pulling strings from the relational database management system. You're pulling strings from an HTML template, and you're writing strings out to the web connection. If you look at Java programs that are written for the web, about half, visually, about half of the code is the, consists of the word string. You're constantly telling Java, this is a string, this is a string, this is a string. The ML people would say, well, you know, that's great if you don't know how to write a compiler. But if you know how to write a compiler, 
you can actually figure out in a provable, accurate way what is a string. You can raise errors at compile time if somebody's going to say going to add a string to a number without making the programmers laboriously declare all this stuff. So I think that um, I'm not sure if Sun's going to be able to catch up technically to where Microsoft has gotten. Uh, I'm pretty sure that in the long run people are going to find that Java and J2E just doesn't work. Um, and I think the main reason is not this more advanced language stuff, because there have been more advanced languages at all times. Well, there's, for all the time that C has been a, actually, for all the time that C has existed, there have been better computer languages, and still people use C for social and practical reasons. Um, so I don't think it's going to be the existence of better languages than Java that kill off J2E from becoming the overarching success, but the fact that it's unfriendly to scripting languages. Okay, so let's shift gears out of the dreary world of programming. Back to the stuff that matters. E-commerce. <laughs> let's start with simple e-commerce. So most e-commerce sites ask the question of, let's say you built a store, somebody built a store right near your house, <clears throat> and it was a really nice store with a lot of goods on the shelves and brightly lit, but you never saw anybody in there. So let's look at this consumer product site. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get some guns. All right, firearms. Um, hmm. I thought there was a nice 380 gun here. All right, well, this is a fine gun, I'm sure. Oh, actually, maybe. No, OK. All right, so here's a little gun. Oh, mini guns. Um, what evidence is there that anyone else out there has been buying these guns, using them, enjoying them? It's like going into a big store. It's like you walk by the store every day, and you never see anyone in the store. Are you going to go in and shop, or don't you think that maybe there's something wrong with the store? So by contrast, this is a site I visit every day. <clears throat> OK. So here we are. This is a good one. This is the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, JPFO. Here is Rabbi Mermelstein. In addition to his background in rabbinics, he was in the business of manufacturing high-grade ammo for 11 years. He was in the US Army Infantry also. OK. So if you look at, here's a guy saying, it's question and answer. Let me begin by writing that although I am a Gentile, I have been very impressed by your responses to the posted questions. You are providing a vital service. <laughs> so the part of the site that this user really likes the most is the fact that he can get his question answered here and that other people are getting their questions answered here. Dear Bill, I spent a lot of time in load development for the .380 ACP, blah, blah, blah. Like most, I too am a creature of habit. If weather dictates that I dress light, I'll usually carry a Smith & Wesson Model 60. <laughs> <laughs> now today, it's cold enough for a jacket, so the carry feast is a Colt Officer's Model 45 caliber. Let's, let's scroll back up. There he is. OK. <clears throat> let's give you another example. Now here's Site 59 which we talked about before. Let's go for, should we go for last minute luxury? 